Kane, let me ask you something. Uh, you're into all this God nonsense. Wow, you sure know how to term the source. <laughs> so a bunch of Bible thumpers got to Leslie. Um, I'm afraid she joined your cult. So if somebody, somebody wanted to do an investigation into Christianity. Oh, like a hit piece. Mm -hmm. Well, but, you know, if that's where the evidence leads. <laughs> Seems to me you got yourself a catch-22. What's that? Well, let's say you debunk Christianity. How's Leslie gonna live with the man who destroyed the very thing that now gives her life meaning? No, well, I... because I should be the thing. And it's then what if life. Leslie's right? And you prove your theory of science and reason wrong. How are you gonna live with yourself? I'm willing to take that chance. Okay. You're a journalist. Check it out. Where would you start? Unless you want to do two years of seminary, I'd say go straight for the jugular. The entire Christian faith hinges on the resurrection of Jesus. If it didn't happen, it's a house of cards. He's reduced to a misunderstood rabbi at best. At worst, he's a lunatic who was martyred. For a guy who thinks I'm trying to assassinate Christianity, you sure you want to hand me that gun? I'm pretty sure you're not going to be able to pull the trigger. All right, who's the big authority on the resurrection? Gary Habermas, as he debated Anthony Fluick as one of my heroes. He's in Wisconsin, by the way. Big debate this weekend. Wisconsin? Mm-hmm. We'll go to Wisconsin. Everything in Christianity hinges on the resurrection. We're going to do a little interactive thing here at this campus, and if you're at home watching online, or if you're at one of the other campuses, I want you to have your hand ready, okay? So you raise your hand if, if you agree. Do you believe that Jesus Christ, the person, historically really lived? Raise your hand if you believe that. Okay, good, all right. Hands down. Question number two. Do you think Jesus Christ was actually hung on a cross and crucified by the Romans? Raise your hand if you believe that. All the campuses? At home, good. Okay, hands down. Now here's what's interesting. If you go to historians at every major university, Yale, Harvard, Oxford, Cambridge, Southern Oregon University, at all of the major universities, I went to Southern Oregon University, at all the major universities and you walked into every historical uh, society there and you asked them, do you believe that Jesus Christ really lived? To a man, every professor will raise his hand and say, yes, he really lived. Then you say, do you believe that he was really crucified on the cross? They will all raise their hand. Every one of them. Here is the difference. Not did Jesus really live. Not did Jesus really die. Did Jesus Christ rise from the dead is a very different question. Today we're going to focus in on the hinge point of Christianity. Did Jesus Christ, who is God, leave heaven, come to earth, die on a cross, and then rise from the dead three days later. We're going to pull that apart and look at that specifically. And let me tell you, here's my goal for you. That as you process this, that you kind of tear this back, that you open up your heart and say, do I really believe that a man was God, came to earth, died on a cross, and then rose three days later? And here's what I hope will happen. That as you wrestle with that, your trust level will grow. And as you grow in trust, you will fall in love. Because the deeper your trust level in who Jesus was, the deeper your love can be in connection with him. So as we look at this, i got to give you a couple little um, background vocabulary words. That way you'll have a better understanding of some of the things that we're talking about. The first one is called the gospel. Gospel, it means good news. Okay, good news. In fact, the original word was good spell, which is a good story. It's the story that man is sinful, that God loves man, left heaven in the form of Jesus Christ, came to earth, lived a perfect life, died on the cross, and rose three days later. When we use the term gospel, we also use this to refer to the first four books of the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all four of them were written to tell the story of Jesus, which is the story of... Okay, so when I point there, you'll read it, okay? So Jesus Christ comes to earth, which is the story of... At the other campuses, they were on it, and you guys here that are live, I, man, this is embarrassing. I, I feel bad for you, okay? It's the good news. The second word that you need is canonization, which means the measurement of what books make it into Scripture. There have been lots of books written about Jesus. They're not all in the Bible, 
okay? So we're going to look at that specifically, and that will help us understand a little bit more clearly. We're going to look at a special story in relationship to the resurrection in John 20. So if you have a Bible and you want to turn there, you can. If not, I'll have the story up on the screen for you. It's about a guy who's got a really, really bad nickname. I had a nickname, and if you look at me, it may make sense to you. When I was a kid, they called me Opie. Because I looked like Opie Taylor, right? His nickname, his name's Thomas. His nickname is Doubting Thomas. And you'll actually see where it came, comes right here. John 20, verse 24 through 29. Now Thomas, known as Didymus, at this point they just called him Didymus, but it comes out later they called him, what? Doubting Thomas, poor guy. He was one of the 12. Well, when Jesus shows up with the rest of them, he wasn't there. Have you ever been late for church? Raise your hand. So how many of you were late today? Yeah, okay, yeah. If you were late, you may have missed something amazing that happened. Well, Thomas wasn't there. I don't know if he was late. But Jesus comes into the room. He's risen from the dead. And the rest of them are like, hallelujah. And you can imagine. These guys have been with Jesus for three years. Then the hope of their future dies on a cross. They have lost all hope until he walks into the room with the door locked. What a moment. But Thomas, he wasn't there. So Thomas was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. Can you imagine what it must have felt like for Thomas? I tell you, I missed church one time. And this is what I get. Watch what it says, though. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and I put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Great timing there, buddy. About a week later... This is where it plays out. A week later, his disciples were in the house again. So they're all back in that upper room. Where before Jesus died, the place where they had communion, they all come back there. And Thomas was with them this time. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Quiet moment. The look on Thomas's face. I can't prove this. I think his face turned pale. I don't care what his complexion was. Then he said to Thomas, first time in history that someone ever said this, Put her there, buddy. You can put your finger right here on the nail place. Put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting. Nickname. Nailed it right there. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. He says, great point here. This is where that one of those moments where you know that Jesus isn't just a man. Thomas says to him, you are my Lord and my God. And Jesus doesn't correct him. Listen to what Jesus says to him, though. Because this is powerful and it will affect us all the way to today. Then Jesus told them, because you have seen me, this is such a critical part, what have you seen? Because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet they have believed. For some of you in the room, you're not there yet. You're wrestling with this. For some of you in the room, you've never seen Jesus and he's talking about you. How cool is that? Jesus Christ, 2,000 years ago, talks when he's talking to Thomas. He says, you know, there's going to be some people in Douglas County, years from now, they didn't see my hands, and they didn't put their hand on my side, and yet they believe, and they're blessed for it. Stop doubting and believe. Well, some of you are in the room. This is exactly where you are. You're, where, you're a little bit more with Thomas, and you're wrestling with this idea of the resurrection. What we're going to do is we're going to pull out four tests about this story to see if it holds up. Because there have been people who have read these four Gospels extensively. And as they look at them and they look at history, they don't believe. Paul brought this up, that some people will look at the evidence. Some will turn and believe. Some will wrestle. Some will not. Well, as we look through this, we want to look at four tests. And let me tell you, we're going to scratch the surface. In the short amount of time we have, I'm gonna not, we're not going very deep on any of them. I want you to take these same tests and look deeper into these issues. The first test, when we look at the resurrection of Jesus, whether or not we can trust that this really happened, we want to look at the witnesses who were there. Who were the people that came and saw? So this is a character test. Can you trust the characters? I was uh, at a barbecue, and there was a kid, and he's 9 or 10 years old, a kid that I know fairly well. I know his character. His character is one that you would never trust. He is a perpetual storyteller. So he gets his food, and it's just, his plate is loaded. There is no burger on there. So I ask him, not my kid, I don't really care, but I said, oh, you already eat your burger? And he said, yeah. And before he had finished the word, yeah, I already thought in my head, I don't believe him. You know why I don't believe him? I know his character. And then I figured out really quickly, after I had already thought I don't believe him, 
Then I realized he's had about 41 seconds since he left the line. He didn't have a burger on there. But you know what? My understanding of his character said, I don't trust him. So one of the things we want to ask this question, who are the people that saw Jesus, reported it, and can we trust them? So first idea of with a character, is this a credible witness? One of the, the key witnesses here that sees Jesus after he's risen from the dead is actually his half-brother, his little brother, the son of Mary and Joseph. His name is James. And we know that Jesus appeared to him. 1 Corinthians 15, 7, Paul used the scripture last week. He then appeared to James. That's his half-brother. And then all of the apostles. So Jesus has appeared to him, according to 1 Corinthians 7. Well, can we trust this guy as a witness? Well, here's what's interesting about being the little brother of Jesus. That's got to be rough growing up. Can you imagine when you mess up and your mom says to you, can't you be more like your older brother, Jesus? I feel for James. We're all trying to be more like Jesus, right? Well, listen to this. Jesus grows up, and at 30 years old, he begins his ministry. And he heads off. He gathers his 12 disciples and becomes someone who uh, is a real public figure. Everyone sees him and hears him. He's claiming to be, he calls it the Son of Man and the Son of God. And he's claiming to be the Messiah, well, in Mark 3, we see his family appear, including his mom, Mary, and his brothers, which includes James. And here's what they thought of their older brother. My brothers, oh, wait, skip that one, go to the next one. Oh, it's gone. I missed it. Bummer. In Mark 3, here's what it says, that Mary and the brothers came to meet with Jesus because they thought he was out of his mind. You know how in every family there's a crazy uncle? In Jesus' family, they thought it was Jesus. Man, that makes for a very awkward Thanksgiving when, when the crazy uncle shows up, doesn't it? They thought it was Jesus, that he was the one that was just crazy. So they show up when Jesus is doing his ministry. And when he's doing that, he actually responds when he hears that they're outside waiting for him. And he says, hey, my family are the people that are doing God's will. And he actually refuses to see them. Well, how do you go from being a guy who thinks your older brother is crazy to being someone who is a follower. It's simple. That man dies and then appears to you later. What is it that pushes James over the edge? In fact, James later writes a book of the Bible, one of those great books that really brings clarity to what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Five chapters he talks about. It. Listen to what it says in James chapter uh, 2, verse 1. My brothers and sisters, believers in my crazy uncle Jesus... It doesn't say that. It says, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. How do you go from my, this guy's out of his mind to he is the glorious Lord, Savior, Messiah, Christ? We don't see at any point that James is a follower of Jesus until after Jesus rises from the dead because he is a key witness revealing the truth of the God. This guy saw it happen and it transformed his picture of it. Another key witness in this, I would say, is a guy named Peter. Peter was one of Jesus' closest followers. He was on the inside. He was a guy who lived with his foot in his mouth. In fact, if you look at the first part of all four of the Gospels, you continually see him saying and boasting and saying big bravado. And then he would often end up with his foot in his mouth and tripping over himself. In fact, the night that Jesus was tried, the day before he was executed, he looked at a, a, a young teenage girl and said, I don't even know who Jesus is. He denied he knew Jesus to a little girl. And after Jesus rises from the dead and Peter sees him and his heart is changed, this witness within four chapters in Acts chapter 4, listen to what it says that he, he, he says there. He's been brought on to trial. Now he's in front of the most important supreme court in the land. And they say to him, stop talking about Jesus. This is the guy, remember, just less than a year before said, I don't even know who Jesus was to a, to a little junior high girl. Now he says this, but Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. They have seen Jesus dead and rise to life, and it changes the way they live. Notice the difference when you look at the 12 disciples. One of them, Judas, kills himself as after he has betrayed Jesus. The other 11 commit their lives to this. These are credible witnesses. Now, the next thing that, that will come into question is, are the witnesses credible? But then you have to ask the secondary question. Can we trust the way we've heard from them? Because what if 
their evidence is in the Bible and you can't trust the Bible. Here's really where it comes down to. Can you trust the scripture? Can you trust the Bible? This is what we call the credibility test. And one of the big questions here is if you look at the four stories, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those are the four stories about Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection. Each of them look different. Why are the Gospels different? In fact, just looking at the story of the resurrection, you'll see this. In Matthew, on Resurrection Sunday, the first people to see Jesus are women. And in Matthew, there are two women that show up. In Mark, there are three women that show up. In Luke, there are a group of women. And in John, all we know about is one, Mary Magdalene. Why are they different? If this is the truth of God's word, if this came from heaven, if this story is true, how come they couldn't line their story up? There's a problem with the Bible. Well, let's play that out all the way with you. If I gave you five minutes to write down the story of what happened right before the speaker came up, at all of our campuses, there was a time of musical worship. And if I had everyone in here write down what they saw, what would we have? We'd have some people over here. They wrote down what songs were sung. Some people over here wrote down the names of all the people that were on stage. People in the back would write, this is what I didn't like. No offense to you back there. Others would say, this is how my heart was moved. And I would say to you, can't you get your story straight? Ah, Listen carefully. If every story in the Gospels had exactly the same facts, we would be concerned. Do you know why? Because it's collusion. Whenever you're trying to perpetrate a fraud and you're trying to get away with something, everyone gets together. All right, here's the story. Let's all agree. Uh, you realize when you, when you play this out that the first witnesses actually couldn't have even been witnesses at the time. According to Jewish custom and Jewish law, women weren't allowed to testify because that's how, that's how society across the world at that time viewed women. And who were the first people to show up? Women. Why would the Bible put that in there? It hurts their case. You know why they put it in there? Because that's what happened. And they'll let the chips fall where they may. If it doesn't convince the Jewish people, that's not the point. They wrote down the facts as what happened. So when you look at this and you say, look at the discrepancies between them, the essence of the story is the same. Walk through the facts. Number one, a group of women went to see an empty tomb with a stone that was rolled away. Jesus wasn't there, and they were given a message that he had risen. Is the essence of the story the same in all four? Yes. The details are different, just like they would be if you wrote down the story of what we did during worship. There was a, 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 just a prominent archaeologist. His name was uh, Sir William Ramsey. Uh, it looks like this. Sir William Ramsey, Ramsey sought for 15 years to disprove the author Luke for two reasons. One of them was for the gospel and also for the book of Acts. And he traveled all over Asia Minor. And his goal was to prove that all of the places that were in there didn't really exist, that the entire setup of the book was, was fraudulent. After 15 years, this is his response. This is the conclusion he comes to. Luke is a historian of the first rank. This author should be placed along with the very greatest historians. As he tests the Bible, as he presses it, as he pulls on it, as he looks at it more clearly, he realizes in actuality this is totally a viable option. This is exactly what they said happened. And he actually becomes a, a, uh, a professor teaching people about the New Testament and how it's a viable option. It's a powerful thing. Uh, the next thing that I want you to look at, so we've looked at, can you trust the characters? And secondarily, we said, can you trust the Bible? Because if you can't trust the Bible, who cares what the characters said? Because if that's not truth from the, from the Bible. So the next one we want to look through is what does it mean to have a cover-up? Because as we evaluate this, if Jesus didn't really rise from the dead, then this whole thing is a hoax. Someone's perpetrating a fraud on everybody, including you. It means that for the last 43 minutes, you've been wasting your life if this didn't really happen. In fact, for some of you who have been following a long time, you've wasted a whole lot of time. So was there an attempt to do a cover-up? And the way we, we look at this is the witnesses, when it comes to those women, when it comes to James, and when it comes to Peter and John, what do they witnesses stand to gain? 
is it profitable for them to tell everyone Jesus rose from the dead? Well, how does it play out for them? Remember that whole idea of collusion that they would all get together and talk that through? You want to know a time when we are guaranteed that collusion happened? You get together and you get your story straight. Anyone remember the Watergate 7? Okay, a little background for you, historical background. In 1972, a group of seven men, a part of the inner circle of Richard Nixon, broke in to the Watergate complex in the Democratic National Convention to try and look for dirt on them. The seven of them were caught. They got together and said, this is our story. Okay, everyone get together. Everyone agree with what we're doing here? Yeah, that story lasted about two weeks. This is Chuck Colson. <laughs> this is called the mugshot. This is what happens when you get together and you try and perpetrate a fraud upon the people. They'll get you. They'll pull your story apart and say, ah, we have him. And they got, it, it took them two weeks to pull the Watergate 7 apart. Well, this guy said this. Well, um, well you know, I mean, uh, she's all, I don't, uh-oh. That's the way it plays out. Well, look at what this means for them. Those men and women who had seen Jesus rise from the dead, when the pressure comes on, why didn't they say, never mind? Do you realize that of the people who were followers of Jesus, there were 11 left after Judas. Ten of them were martyred for their faith. James was run through with a sword. Peter was crucified upside down. This is the moment when you say, hey, never mind. Remember that little scripture I read to you in, in Acts chapter 4? This is what you don't say. Ju you be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. If you're making it up, bail out. When they're about to kill you, that's when you give up. All right? This is why when I look at the cover-up test, what do the witnesses stand to gain? Here's what they gained. Death. And yet the story holds up. If you look at the witnesses, they stand the test. The next thing that I, I notice as I, I look at this is I think there's a confidence test that you have to evaluate. And this is where it's going to get personal for each of us. In fact, I'd like you to, perhaps when you came and we're doing a, a study looking at ready to give a defense, what you may be thinking to yourself is, this is a whole lot of head knowledge. This is the part where I want you to engage both your head and I want you to engage your heart. Okay? So when you look at the confidence test, this is really essentially looking at, do I really trust what God called me to? And do I have faith in it? One of the things I want you to see is, is Jesus' response to Thomas. Now remember, Thomas has said, I will not believe unless I touch his hands and I touch his side. I'm not putting anything out there. I need to know from him. I need proof. He was asking for facts. And where did Jesus point him? Watch this. And Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. This idea of seen, you needed more facts. But blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. You see what Jesus elevates here? He says at some point you have to have faith. Now let me tell you just a little balance here. For those of you in the room, this is where you're wrestling with. You need more and more facts to give your life to Jesus. And I understand where you are. Realize this. If you're in this intense tension where you're looking at trusting in Jesus Christ or what you think is trusting in science, both of them require faith. It takes faith to believe in a theory that says we evolved. It takes faith to believe in Jesus Christ. So let me just honor that moment. Whatever you decide in whatever worldview, both of them require that you say, okay, I trust. Trust and faith will be part of it. And some of you, you've been kicking the tires for a long time and you've got enough facts and it's just time for you to step over the emotion that says, I don't know, and say, I trust you, Jesus I'm in. And I would challenge some of you, this is your weekend, that it's time for you to step over the line and say, okay, Jesus, you're in charge. You don't need anything like Thomas. You don't need to see his hands. You've got enough facts, and it's time to believe. And maybe you're at the very beginning of this journey, and you're about 40 minutes into asking these questions. Then you need to keep digging. Okay? Be willing to ask other people questions. Keep going for it. But eventually realize this, no matter which way you go, it will take faith. But here's an interesting little fact about how the Gospels were written. It is faith, but it is not faith alone. There's another aspect to it. When Luke wrote the Gospel that he wrote, he was not a follower of Jesus who was there when Jesus was alive on earth. 
He came later. He heard the story of the gospel. He, be, he was, had never actually met Jesus. He chose to follow Jesus. And then after becoming a follower of Jesus, he set out to say, I want to know exactly what happened. And in the process of him saying why he did it, it reveals something very, very important. Since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I don't know if you're one of those that needs a lot of facts. Luke did too. He has investigated carefully from the beginning. I too decided to write an orderly account for you. Most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know that the certainty of the things that have been taught. This Jesus really lived and really died. He really rose again. I'm writing a book. I'm writing it down so that other people will have the facts. This really happened. And like Sir William Ramsey said, not only did it happen, this guy is a top rate, highest rank historian. You can trust him. John said something very similar at the end of his book. In fact, later in the same chapter where he had talked about Thomas, he says, here's why I'm writing it. Listen to this. This is so important. But these things are written that you may believe. I know you need facts, and here they are. Look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Look at their stories and say, is it time for me to step in? Because what some of you have is you have a weak faith. And I'm going to speak specifically to those of you who maybe you grew up in the church. Some of you in the room, you're kicking the tires and you're trying to figure this out. Do you want to believe this? And you need to step out in faith. But some of you, from the very early age, you were five years old and your mom said, you need to believe in Jesus. And you said, okay. And you became a follower. And you go to church and you're a part of it. But at no point have you ever really dug in deep. And if, if anyone really pressed on your belief system, they just pushed on you a little bit, you'd fall over because you got a really weak base. When I was uh, coaching basketball, uh, one of the keys to anything you want to accomplish in basketball is that you have a good foundation, which is why footwork was so critical, that you would have a wide base that you would be able to press against someone. The importance of knowing your foundation. And for some of you, you have a weak faith because you have no facts to back it up. And what you need to do is press in the other way. Just like some need to say, okay, I have enough facts, I'm going to trust. Some of you, you're kind of an easy believer and you went, okay, whatever. And it doesn't really affect your life because you're not really pressing in and believing at a deeper level. And I want to challenge you to that because I think ultimately this is a marriage of both faith and fact. Interesting little component of those Gospels and whether or not you can trust them. When we talk about the canonization, those four guys, here was the rule to get into the Bible. You had to either know Jesus personally and, met, and have met him, or you had to be within one generation so you could interview people. Well, if you look at the people that they chose to put in there, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those people, only Matthew and John were actually followers of Jesus. Mark wasn't a follower of Jesus. He came to Christ later. In fact, he was a disciple or being mentored by Peter. And here's what I found so interesting about that. When Peter told him all of those stories. So when you look at Mark, see it through the eyes of Peter. What you would guess is that Peter would have made himself look better. But you know, every story where Peter has his foot in his mouth, you can find it in Mark. In fact, in Mark 14, he tells the story of how Peter denied he knew Jesus. And earlier in that, he, he told how Peter boasted that he would never leave Jesus. You see, when you look at the scriptures and whether or not you can trust them, whether or not you can believe them, there's a solid foundation there. One of the things that has to happen, though, is at some point it has to be your own. You have to own it. I, uh, we have a little axiom in our home, something that we, we live by. If you see a mess, you clean a mess. Well, that's a great thing to say, but I got kids. So do the kids live that out? And on Wednesday, my daughter, she's nine years old, she and I went to Home Depot. I needed some little sprinkler heads. So we walked down that plumbing aisle, and the guy was throwing freight. And guess where his ladder was? Right where the sprinkler heads that I needed. And so he's pulling the little boxes, and he's got a little cart, and he's throwing the boxes in there. And I was talking to him, yeah, I need four of those right there. And it was perfect. He didn't have to move. He just reached in and got them. And while we're dealing with these little sprinkler heads, I look out of the corner of my eye, and my daughter has walked around me walked over to the cart where the boxes are, and he's missed one. She didn't mock him. She simply picked the box up and put it in the cart. Because when the nine-year-old saw a mess, she cleaned a mess. And it was funny. So we got in the car. I'm like, hey, man, see a mess, clean a mess. And she said to me, Dad, I didn't even think about that. 
Now, the axiom of our home, which is if you see a mess, you clean a mess, her response was, I didn't think about you saying it or what you would say. No one bribed her. She owns it. That's now how she lives her life. You see the movement, the difference here, where it's not just because mommy said it, daddy said it, because I like the student leader. At some point, that little thing about a mess, she owns it. And here's my question for you and your faith with Jesus Christ. Is it yours yet? Or is it because mommy told you that? Or because you really like the student leader? Or because you really ha like Pastor Paul? Is it your faith? And let me ask you this. Think of the people who have influenced in your walk with Jesus Christ. If they weren't around, would you still believe? I have been blessed throughout my life with some amazing people who have been mentors for me. When I was in seventh grade, Steve Jacobson was our youth leader. And in my eighth grade year, I was mentored by a guy named Greg. When we moved away, I had Ken Gearhart and Teresa Dovum. Later on in college, I had a guy named Ryan Roden and Garris Elkins. When I moved to, to Roseburg, I had Dave York and Paul Glazner and later Ed Wilgus. I had some amazing mentors in my life. Do you know that there was a gap between every single one of them? And there was a time where I had no one that was speaking in. It was just me and Jesus and my Bible. Let me ask you, have you come to the place where your decision to be a follower of Jesus has been yours, not because of the people that are around you? If it hasn't, you have not yet stepped into a deep faith. It has to be owned by you. So I ask you this. Have you pulled that along? Have you come to a marriage of faith and fact? Do you understand the key components of both? Some of you need to lean in farther to the facts because you have a weak faith. And some of you have enough facts and you need to move in with faith and say, okay, I trust you. I got a couple more questions. But first, I'm going to release to the other campuses. And Pastor Sky and Pastor Paul are going to take over there. Love you guys. So as we go with this, I told you we were scratching the surface. So now it's your turn. Our first challenge for you this week is I want you to spend at least 30 minutes researching the history of the Gospels. There's a couple great uh, resources for you. One of them is the case for Christ. Basically, so he was a journalist, and when his wife came to Christ, he set out to disprove, as they said on that video, he came to disprove the truth of who Jesus was. And as he kept looking and looking and looking, he found he couldn't. Another one is, uh, that's on your outline, uh, on the back side there, is Evidence That Demands a Verdict by Josh McDowell. I think he went to law school and came to a very similar uh, background. But those are great, uh, great reads that will help you a lot in understanding the depth of that. And then the next thing I want to challenge you with is really to evaluate this. You'll notice when we do these next steps, we often challenge you with a question. Where does your faith need to grow? Where is it that you may need more facts to bolster something? Um, I want to go ahead and pray for us, uh, and then we have a couple things we want to share with you. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for uh, the depth of your love for us. I thank you that you have given us a scripture that we can trust. I thank you that you've given us a love that is so powerful that you're willing to leave heaven and come to earth to die for us. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video. And uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here, and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person. And I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really. And so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me, or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging. And we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So if you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can... Uh, Give us some feedback. We'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.